Hey, Good Success community, Josh Keller here, host of the Good Success Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode. But before we get into this awesome episode of the Good Success Podcast, we'd like to take a quick minute and thank our sponsors. And first is Sharper Business Solutions and our good friend Gary Harper. And listen, your business is a personal endeavor that you have poured your blood, sweat, and tears into. Sharper Business Solutions is a full service solution to help you scale your dream. Sharper Business Solutions implements the Sharper process and other key systems giving you the confidence and freedom to keep growing and scaling as a company. The Sharper team wants to come alongside you and provide the resources needed for long-term growth and success. Schedule your free consultation today at sharperprocess.com. And let me tell you, these guys are amazing. A lot of our mastermind members have hired Gary and the Sharper team to come and implement EOS and processes and systems into their business and their scaling is very, very much apparent and uh, they've grown exponentially. So make sure you guys check them out one more time. That's sharperprocess.com. And we'd like to say a quick thank you to Veterans Path Up and our good friend Ken Lacey. And Veterans Path Up's mission is to provide affordable stable housing to veterans and veteran families through the use of shared living single family residences and ultimately a path to home ownership. Their emphasis is to provide housing for homeless working and disabled veterans, many of whom do not qualify for long-term support from any government agency. Veterans Path Up ascribes to the philosophy of helping those with a hand up as opposed to a hand out. Veterans Path Up provides a critical link to the veteran by bridging the gap to other supportive veteran services. This is accomplished through education and awareness to available support with the ultimate goal of getting the veteran and family on a path to self-sufficiency. Through the use of private and philanthropic funding, Veterans Path Up acquires rehabs and places veterans into the appropriate housing for where they are with respect to their current financial picture. Improving neighborhood housing and showing veterans a path up strengthens the community and strengthens the country while helping those who have protected our freedom. You can visit veteranspathup.org to make a donation or find out how you can help impact our veterans even further. So without further ado, let's take a quick sneak peek of what you'll hear on this episode of the Good Success Podcast. Ever ask for money and most people are uncomfortable asking for money and rightly so because in truth, you're not asking for money. What you are doing is you're offering people the opportunity to collaborate with you on a project. And that is absolutely the, the, the right mindset to have. And if you approach it from that perspective, it changes the tone, it changes the character of the conversation dramatically. It's not a situation where you're on your knees begging. Uh, if you have something that's truly compelling, in fact, it would be disloyal to not offer that opportunity to someone with whom you have a meaningful relationship. So it's, it's really, it's almost the reverse. Welcome back to the Good Success Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Culler. Got Tom Olson, president of Good Success, sitting right here next to me. That's me. What's going on, Tom? How you doing? Pretty good, Josh. How you doing? I'm, I'm doing great. Having a good 2019. Yes, 2019 is upon us already. Rolling heavy. Um, so we have a very special guest on the show today. We have Victor Manash out of Ottawa. Victor, what is going on, my friend? How you doing? Great to be here. Awesome. So Victor, uh, I believe you met. So you want to kind of explain how you met him? Because you looped him in with me. So sure. That we so him on the show. he was at um, High Speed Alliance when I was there. And then I also met him at the Single Family Office Summit in Miami, which was actually a really good event. Awesome stuff. Um, and so Victor is the host of the Real Estate Espresso podcast, which we're going to be recording a little bit of a segment after this. So we're excited about that. And he is also on one of my personal favorite podcasts, which is Entrepreneurs on Fire with John Lee Dumas. Um, he was on episode 1875 with him. So that's exciting. Make sure you guys go check that out. And then he's the author of Magnetic Capital, How to Raise All the Money You Need for Any Worthy Venture. And that is available on his website and Amazon. But if you go to his website, he's going to mail you an autographed copy. So his website is victorjm.com. So that's V-I-C-T-O-R-J-M. Dot com. So make sure you take advantage of that. Um, I, I like that, Josh. I think maybe we should do that. An autograph copy? Yeah, if they, if they, I, I if they come to our website. 
That's true. We should do that. We should do that. We should do that. I like that idea. It's on Amazon, but if you go to the website and pick it up there. Right so here. Can... Masterminding right here. Right. On the, live on the podcast. Exactly. There we go. And he, he didn't even have to say anything about it. <laughs> awesome right. stuff. So, um, Victor, we're going to come back around to you in just a second. But uh, the today's quote is, a mentor gives you wisdom, the wisdom without the weight. And that is by Larry Goins, our good friend over there in North Carolina, on episode 112 of the Good Success Podcast. So make sure you go listen to that. Larry's an awesome friend of ours and uh, so great stuff. So the Good Success Mastermind coming up, this is going to be the end of January where this podcast is being published. So the next event is February 4 through 8 in Dallas, Texas, but um, maybe a little too close, but maybe it's not. Maybe you're in the Texas neighborhood and you can make it out there. And if you guys want to learn more about that, go to goodsuccess.com slash mastermind. Uh, fill out the application there and you'll talk to either myself or Tom. And then the next event after that is May 14 through 18. That's in Miami, Florida at an NBC Suites down there. And we're very excited about both of these events coming up. And um, we'll have a lot to report on with those. So make sure you guys take advantage of that. Goodsuccess.com slash mastermind. To learn more about our group, we've created an incredible culture of people that we absolutely love. Um, great stuff. You know, we vet every single person that comes in the room by our core values, community, stewardship, growth, and charity. And we have just, we, we have... We've had a couple of mastermind members on the podcast here, so you guys make sure you go back and listen to those. Um, then the Community Go-Giver event is coming up June 26, 27, 28. A lot more details to come out soon, but early bird price tickets are gonna be going away soon, so make sure you take advantage of that at communitygogiver.com. Save a couple hundred bucks. We have some returning speakers that spoke at our first event in July of 2017 that are gonna be back in June, like Jim Ingersoll and Jeffrey Taylor and then Ken Lacey. And we have some awesome new speakers that are gonna be there. So make sure you go to communitygogiver.com, learn more about that. Tom, do you wanna talk about it a little bit? Just buy your tickets. Just buy your tickets. Just be here. Don't delay, act right now. We are flipping the city of Gary, Indiana and it's happening in front of our eyes. So I, I just encourage you to come see what it, all the fuss is all about. All the fuss. With flipping Gary. All the fuss about flipping Gary. So make sure you go take advantage of that. Save a couple hundred bucks. Again, early bird price tickets are going away very soon. Communitygogiver.com. So let's get into this interview today. I'm very excited. And I I actually said it before the we even started the podcast. And Victor, we had a little bit of a time mix up. But I appreciate you being willing to jump on, take time with us. And uh, it's great to have you on the show today. So do us a favor, introduce yourself, who you are, what you do, how long you've been doing that, and some things about yourself. Well, you gave me a great introduction to begin with, but uh, I'm a developer. I develop both here in Canada and in the U.S., uh, mostly infill development. We do a fair bit of greenfield development as well. And uh, I love the development game. It's one of the things that gives me a tremendous amount of uh, joy. I get to exercise a, a creative muscle. Um, and uh, my background is actually not in real estate. I started out my career in the high-tech industry, I, not the traditional career path into the world of real estate development. Started out as a microprocessor designer, uh, as an electrical engineer, and I built microprocessors that are used in all kinds of different applications all over the world. You know, if you've flown on any Airbus aircraft, the seatback displays on most of those planes have my microprocessor in them. If you made a phone call anywhere in North America after about 1991, 52% of the phone calls in North America were processed by a chip that I designed. Uh, and I can go on down the list of many, many different applications. So that's my background and uh, got into the world of real estate investing around 2009, 2010. Perfect time. Yeah. Uh, when, you know, shortly after the meltdown and it was really the opportunity of a lifetime where it was hard to make mistakes. And I made plenty. But the marketplace cushioned me from a lot of those mistakes. So it was a good time to enter. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, definitely a perfect timing getting into there. An opportunistic time for you to jump into real Correct. estate. So so what yep. got you interested in real estate? So you talked about how you just you, you started getting into real estate investing in 09 and 2010. Uh, but what really got piqued your interest to get into the real estate investing world? Well, there's a couple of things. Uh, you know, I started out at that particular time, I was working on building a new cellular network in Japan and traveling back and forth to Tokyo every couple of weeks. And frankly, it was burning me out. Uh, so it was really looking to see what else I could do. And um, I had the opportunity to join another startup company that was developing vision chips that would be used in automotive applications. You know, these are the things that keep your car in the lane and so on. But it was owned by a Korean company. And and at that point, I said, you know what, I've just been spending two years flying back and forth to Japan, swapping out Korea for Japan is 
not the right thing. So I uh, really decided to take a hard left turn in my career at that point in time and do something completely different. And in the world of technology, uh, you know, it's exciting. There's lots of new things all the time. But as an investment strategy, it makes very little sense. You know, if I told you that to design a new chip, the minimum investment is 50 million bucks and maybe in year four, I'm going to give your money back and maybe by year five, I'll make you a profit. Are, are you lining up for that investment? So, it really. sounds just like I mean, real estate, right? <laughs> well, even worse. I mean, it, it's, you know, it's like saying I want to win the lottery when I grow up. Right. You know? exactly. So uh, it, it's just a completely different, uh, you know, mode. And so uh, what I liked about real estate, of course, is that uh, people will lend you money uh, where they won't quite as readily in technology. And, um, and there isn't the uh, consolidation that exists in the tech industry. You know, if you have the depth of pockets of an Intel or a Samsung or one of these tier one players, you can buy your way into pretty much any segment of the market. But in real estate, it's not like that. It's not like that. It's not consolidated down to three players. There are literally millions of players. And you can eke out a dominant position in some geographic area uh, on your own. You don't need to rely upon a big brother necessarily or anything like that. So you could really carve out your own empire, if you will, uh, in real estate where it's much more difficult in the world of technology. Yeah, absolutely. It's like the entrepreneur's dream, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. and you yeah. can actually make money doing it. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So, so your book that's on Amazon, but if you want to go to his website to get an autographed copy, victorjm.com. Uh, so your book, Magnetic Capital, um, tell us a little bit about that. So if somebody were to purchase that today and uh, pick that up and just like really dig into it, what can they expect to get out of it? So it's really written from the perspective of someone who's been doing this practically for a number of years. And I learned to raise money in the tech industry, uh, first and foremost. That's where I really developed that skill. Uh, and it didn't matter whether it was raising money for uh, a technology venture, for a corporate acquisition. I've done five different corporate acquisitions in my day, uh, doing a private placement memorandum to do, a, a, let's say, a product line extension, or even a real estate venture. The process for raising money, and I discovered this on my own, the process is virtually the same. It doesn't matter what you're doing. Uh, even raising money for a charity, that process is remarkably similar. And so when I discovered that it was uh, most of the time difficult to raise money, but when this unique set of ingredients came together and they all aligned perfectly, all of a sudden raising money became remarkably easy. And when I discovered that particular formula, uh, it was like, oh, that's how you do it. And so that's really the core of the book is what are the things that you need to do to make raising money remarkably easy? Hmm. That's it. Interesting. I like that. Make and raising money easy. really is easy, isn't it? It, it, you know, the hard part is actually the execution of the projects. Once you know, once you know the formula to raise money, it is remarkably easy. You just got to know to look in the right place. And if, it, if there are five fundamentals, if you meet all five of those fundamentals, uh, it really is quite straightforward. Yeah, absolutely. So one thing that Tom actually talks about a little bit when it comes to, to raising, raising money, period, um, is not having the mindset of like you're asking for money, but having the correct mindset of giving them an opportunity and, and whatnot. So can you expound on that a little bit? Why it's so important to have the right mindset when raising capital for those people out there that may be scared to go and ask somebody for, for, ask them the, for money for their deals or whatnot? Well, that's exactly right. In fact, that's one of the things that I talk about in the book. Um, I don't ever ask for money. And most people are uncomfortable asking for money, and rightly so. Because in truth, you're not asking for money. What you are doing is you're offering people the opportunity to collaborate with you on a project. And that is absolutely the, the, the right mindset to have. And if you approach it from that perspective, it changes the tone. It changes the character of the conversation dramatically. It's not a situation where you're on your knees begging uh, if you have something that's truly compelling, in fact, it would be disloyal to not offer that opportunity to someone with whom you have a meaningful relationship. So mm -hmm. it's, it's really, it's almost the reverse. Absolutely. Interesting. That's, that's interesting. It's exactly what I say. I just don't say it so, so eloquently. So eloquently. Yeah. You, you, don't, you don't make it a, 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 a poem. <laughs> okay, great. So, so you, yeah, I like that. So no, it's funny. So something. I have about a hundred and I think I have 128 people on my, my own personal lenders list. And like these people have become really good friends of us, you know, ours, we get, 
Christmas gifts from them and like they just love working with us because and every time we send them a deal they're like thank you for sending me this yeah. opportunity you know it is it is it is so true um and you know people are bugging us to actually send them deals it's not the other way around where we're bugging them to send them deals you know so we, so we kind of have in our queue of when people when we have deals available and like well this person's been bugging us you know the most so let's send it to yeah. that person first right right well I like, I like what he said about you're, you're you're taking if if you have that mindset then you're taking an opportunity away from somebody else if right. you're scared to ask them um but absolutely so kind of segueing into the next question then because Maybe one of the reasons why they're scared about asking for, for capital is because the deal is not done correctly or they don't know how to structure the deal. So when it comes to a proper way to structure a good deal, what are some tips that you can give for that? Well, so it really starts with understanding um, what I call alignment. And this is one of the five principles that you need to raise money effectively. Money always has an agenda. It always has a set of goals. And if the goals for the project don't match the goals for the money, then don't take the money. If you're trying to do anything that's forced or anything that is a forced fit, it's not going to work. Even if it looks like it almost works, it doesn't work. Uh, something that almost works is seductive. It has that feeling like, oh, this could actually work. But something that almost works doesn't. So if there's any element that's forced, don't do it. And when I talk about alignment, it's understanding what the goals for the money are in terms of you know, the size of the investment, what's the term of the investment, how long is the money going to be tied up for, what's the rate of return, what's the risk, what's the security, what's the control structure, what's the tax consequence, all of these things come into play. And if you don't have a perfect match on all those, it's not going to work, don't take the money. But once you develop an ecosystem of 10, 20, 50, a couple of hundred folks that are similar enough, in terms of what they're looking for, now you can design and you can structure your projects to be an ideal fit for all those people because you've built it that way. And then assessing the fit's not an issue because it's all kind of correct by construction. Gotcha. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's absolutely. awesome. So, you know, it, it, a couple things that come to my mind when you say that, and um, if you know me and, and listen to me or talk to me much, you, you know that my focus is way more on people than it is on the money. And what right. you really articulated I think the exact same way when I'm hiring an employee. So it's the exact same concept. If you're not properly aligned, if your guys aren't going in the same direction, you know, then don't waste that employee's time trying to fit them into a job that they're really not going to going to ever succeed at and you're not going to be happy. They're going to be frustrated. It's the exact same concept with that. You, now you can't do that with your kids. You can't really choose <laughs> your kids or your family. Those, you got what you got. Those are those are God-given <laughs> responsibilities, but that's kind of um, in our stewardship, when we talk about stewardship, you know, having a good steward for those people. And that is it's same thing with their money. You know, being a good steward for their money means make sure they are properly aligned. I love that. I love that concept. Thank you for that. Well, yeah. So then, so then what are some things you, you said, be a good steward. So what are some other things that you can think of, um, that could hinder a relationship when it comes to, a, a, a raising capital with somebody? Well, it's a, f a couple of things. Number one, you know, the number one rookie mistake that I see people make is they always start with the deal. They think it's all about the deal, the deal, the deal, and it's almost never about the deal. Uh, now, of course, you have to have something that is compelling enough, but it doesn't have to be a home run. It doesn't have to be anything particularly spectacular, but it's got to be the right kind of uh, the right kind of deal, the right kind of structure. And then you put that to the side. It really starts with relationship. I mean, you talked about it a few minutes ago is putting the focus on relationship and and it's not the same as networking or anything like that. I mean, you know, I hate the I hate the word networking. It has this utilitarian feel like I'm going to go to some event and I'm going to collect as many business cards uh, as I can and work the room and all that stuff. Well, that has a utilitarian feel and I mean, do you want to be used? I don't. I, nobody wants to be used. So so don't do that. Focus on genuine relationships. And you can get different things from different relationships and you can contribute to those relationships in meaningful ways. You know, you, you, yes, there will be a subset of those relationships that will get you access to capital. Uh, some of them will give you access to opportunities. Some of them will lend you credibility. Uh, some will simply make introductions. Some will give you advice. You know, you get many different things from different relationships. And if you focus on the relationship and at some point down the road in the distant future, 
you do business together, well, that's great too, but that's not necessarily the goal. So that's kind of how I look at it. And, you know, if you follow the natural human process and you think about even just a romantic relationship, you know, uh, two people get together, you know, they discover they have some common interests, they go for dinner, they go out on a date, they go watch a movie. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of very natural steps a long way down the road, they may decide to get together, you know, get married, and, you know, start a family. But if you skip steps anywhere in that process, it goes from a natural relationship progression to creepy in a heartbeat. <laughs> right? It can yeah. get creepy really fast. <laughs> right? And yet, how often in the business world do people go to creepy? I yeah. mean, it happens all the time, right? It's like, it happened to me this morning. You know, this person uh, connected with me on social media, and, and then 10 seconds later, you know, please like my page. And it's like, who the heck are you? <laughs> you know, like, so, it, yeah, the, you know, it, how many times do people go to creepy? Just don't, don't do it, you know? Uh, so that's, that's really where it starts. Um, you know, the, the, the second thing that I think is vitally important is establishing the trust. And trust is not just, you know, my dealing with an honest person. It's a more complex psychological contract. It's questions like, can I trust you to put together a good plan? Can I trust you to execute the plan? Can I trust you to hire the right team? Can I trust you with my money? Can I trust you to communicate in an open and transparent way? And on and on and on. All these things have to work together. Uh, and if any one of them's missing, it actually kind of chips away at the trust and doesn't work. One of the clues that I often, it's, a, it's very simple. Uh, when a, a potential funding partner says to you, well, I don't know, I probably need a few more weeks to do due diligence. There's a clue that that trust isn't fully established. Um, and when the trust is there, decisions happen quickly. Mm -hmm. They really do. Yeah, there's It doesn't mean people skip, step, skip steps. But decisions happen quickly. Yeah, there's there's two parts. There's two huge parts of trust. Part of it is just character. So a lot of times when people talk about right. trust, they think it's just the character. It's not just character. It's also the skill level. And do they actually have the skills to do what you're going to have them do? So I trust my wife completely. Like I love, I, 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 would, I would trust her with my life. I trust her for everything. However, I probably wouldn't trust her to do open heart surgery on me. <laughs> um, because right. she doesn't have the skills and she right. doesn't have that knowledge and that, uh, you know, and that, and that, that whole side of her to be able to do that for me. So, and it's the same way with, when it comes to money. Yeah, that's a very interesting Absolutely. Thought. Absolutely. I love it. Um, so Correct. And I guess the other part, the other part of trust, um, is making sure you have the alignment of intention. Mm -hmm. So it, you, you can be dealing with people that have the skills and the competency, but if you're not aiming in the same direction, it's going to be very difficult to trust. Hey guys, we're going to take a quick break from the podcast and say a huge thank you to our sponsor, Jerry Padilla, a senior loan originator with Prime Lending. And whether you're a first time home buyer or you're well versed in the process, buying or refinancing a home can be an exciting and rewarding experience with Prime Lending. Serving you in every state, they take the time to listen and they'll work with you to find a home loan that fits your needs. With the mortgage refinancing, lower your interest rate, lower your monthly payments, shorten your term, or get the cash for whatever you need. Prime Lending also has several options for renovation loans so that you can find what works best for you in your home project. Make sure to contact our good friend and Good Success Mastermind member, Jerry Padilla, who is a senior loan originator with Prime Lending and has over 11 years of experience in the mortgage industry. You can learn more about Prime Lending and what they have to offer by contacting Jerry Padilla at goodsuccess.com slash prime lending. So make sure you take advantage of that to learn more about them. Now, without further ado, let's get back to the show. Awesome. I love that. So there's a few things that I, I came away with on there, even what you just said, that makes a lot of sense. But one thing I want to go back to is you, you mentioned networking. So re networking is a, is a probably a, a good word that we need to slash out. Right. Um, I, yeah, I think of yeah. when we go to these expos, you know, we go to think realty expos and, and they're great expos and whatnot, but the people that we always, always like they come back to us or we get them on the podcast or whatever, they come visit our mastermind. We've had a couple people that um, actually joined the mastermind from Think Realty's group there. And the, those people are the ones that we took the time to build the relationship with. It I wasn't, was. they came by the booth and we hand them a business card and hand them a brochure and said, hey, thanks for stopping by. We'll see you later. And then they go on to the next one. We don't ever hear back from those people, even if we follow up. But the people that we stand there and talk for 45 minutes or an hour yep. with, those are the people that come back and ultimately have 
come to visit the mastermind or join the mastermind, been on the podcast or whatever. So yeah, I mean, the first step of that relationship is always listening. Everybody wants yeah. to talk. Everybody wants to like tell everything about their story and what they have to offer. But at the end of the day, if you don't really know what the other person is looking for, if you don't really know what, how to be aligned with them and if you're even aligned with them, then there's really no hope. I, I, I'm the same way. Like I, and I, I even came back from that event. Um, normally I go to events and I kind of don't really network at all. Mm-hmm. I kind of just kind of just listen for when I can, you know, chime in or when, when, when somebody sets, piques my interest and, and kind of says that this is what I'm having a, a problem with or whatever. But normally if I go back to the same event three or four or five times, you know, I've, I've had it where there's a line of people to come talk to me because I'm willing to just listen to what mm-hmm. they have to say. Um, and I, sometimes I can't even help them, but they just know that I'm willing to listen to right. what they have to say. And that's what most people are just looking for somebody to actually listen to what they have to say. I think that's, that's the good. first step. It's always the first step of building that relationship is to listen. I think that's good because he said, don't be a creeper. Exactly. So the, the, <laughs> the creeper is the one that asks you, you know, to go on a date for the first time yeah. you shake, right. you, you meet them. But you know, the one that actually eases into the relationship is the yeah. one that listens. Right. So for instance, I was at this meeting and this, the, I met this lady and within like 20 seconds, she's like handing me this brochure about telling me about her book and she wanted me to buy her book. And I'm like, Oh my word. Like, I don't even know who this I know lady nothing is. about you. And here, buy, buy my book. Gotcha. Um, and uh, I, 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 that's, that's, that's so funny. I love that. That's a great conversation. Appreciate you sharing that with us. <laughs> um, so, so let's kind of switch tracks here a little bit. One of the topics that you even mentioned about that um, when we were emailing back and forth, something to talk about on the show here is uh, tips on new construction versus repositioning. So can you kind of define that and dig deep into that a little bit for us? Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the biggest surprise areas, and and I don't mean a good surprise, uh, is when you're repositioning a product, you really don't know necessarily what you're dealing with. You're dealing with a whole ton more unknowns. You don't know what's behind the walls. You don't know uh, what hidden skeletons, so to speak, are hiding in that particular project, unless you make some very conservative assumptions. So a risk, let's start with defining what's a risk. A risk is anything that's not in your plan. So for example, if you assume that you've got asbestos in your project and you're going to have to do asbestos remediation and in the end you don't, well, that's a bonus, but it's not a risk because you already it's, it was already taken into account in your plan. But if you, like most people, go into a project, I'll say a little bit more naively and don't necessarily... Uh, have all of those things taken into account, you can have a whole lot of surprises. New construction has the beauty of giving you a great new product at the end of the at the end of the day, and number two, being a much more controlled environment because you know what it takes to get from the start to the finish line. There really quite a f- while there's more to be done. There are in many ways fewer variables, and that's what I love about new construction. Um, the other thing that I love about it is today prices have risen to the point where in many markets, uh, if I look at what things are selling for in the open market, um, I can build for 25, 30% less than things are selling for in the open market. And so while it's more work, uh, I can create a tremendous amount of value that way. And, and, uh, so that's the other thing I like about new construction doesn't mean that applies anywhere and everywhere. I mean, think about it this way. You know, if you go buy a sheet of drywall at Home Depot, it's 10 bucks. doesn't matter where you put it, right? You can put it in a D-class neighborhood or you can put it on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan. That sheet of drywall is still 10 bucks. Now, the value that's going to be attached to that sheet of drywall depends dramatically <laughs> on where you put it. So it's got to, you've got to be able to do it in a place where you can extract sufficient value. And so the focus is on um, location selection. I mean, you know, look, if I'm not building something within a 10 minute drive of my house, I can pretty much go anywhere. I'm really not constrained by geography. So why would I choose a place simply because I happen to live close by? Uh, It doesn't make any sense. You know, I'm a big believer in obeying the laws of supply and demand. It's one of those things that real estate people often get wrapped around the axle on. They start looking at comps and Uh, all kinds of other metrics that are totally, totally meaningless. And they simply forget the fundamentals of supply and demand. You know, they go into markets like Detroit and say, oh, great, I can buy a house for 15 grand. Um, You know, I put it on my credit card. What a deal. Well, is it? 
Um, you know, Detroit used to be 2.2 million people. Now it's like 650,000. It's a shrinking city. There's a reason you're buying houses for 15 grand. It's not because, yes, it could be a deal, but um, if it's a shrinking city, there isn't ever going to be that uh, that growth in demand. And you got to obey those laws of supply and demand. Um, so I love new construction in the right location. Yeah, and then we're going to dive into that a little bit more in just a second. But one thing I want to um, ask, so so when it comes to new construction, what what type of deals are you personally taking a part of? Is it single family homes, multifamily, commercial? What are you experiencing with? I look at I look at this as solving business problems. So, uh, for example, uh, right now uh, we don't have a ton of new construction in Philadelphia. We're doing a little bit this year. We've got about twenty five units in construction. Uh, it's all multifamily. Last year we did about sixty. Um, and, you know, what I like about that particular market is that there's, there's growth. You know, there's people moving in. Uh, a lot of them, for whatever reason, have New York accents. And, uh, you know, if you're living in Manhattan and you've got a six-figure salary, you've got a roommate because that's all you can afford. Um, but many times you can work for the same company, uh, live in Philadelphia. If you take the high-speed rail, you can be into Penn Station in an hour and 10 minutes. And if you have to go into the city a couple of days a week, no big deal. You know, and you get to live at a much lower cost of living uh, in a, in a decent, you know, first world city. So we've been, you know, building a lot in that particular market. Uh, it's been very good for us. We also are right now building uh, several projects in, uh, in Louisiana along the Gulf coast. There's a tremendous amount of uh, natural gas, petrochemical and seaport expansions all along the Gulf coast, uh, you know, uh, between Houston and Baton Rouge, uh, we're centered in a community called Lake Charles, Louisiana. It's a small town of 200,000 people with 118 billion, that's right, with a B, of natural gas, petrochemical, and seaport expansions. And so this town needs everything. You know, they need retail, they need office, they need uh, multifamily, they need single family, they need everything. So right now we have four projects in that community. But um, and at some point, we'll definitely have more. So right now we're doing multifamily. We're doing senior housing and medical office and workforce housing. Uh, at some point, we will also do a residential subdivision. At some point, we'll probably even do a, I don't know, a park and ride, let's say, for for one of the mega plants that need a place to park a thousand or maybe two thousand pickup trucks. Um, it's just solving business problems. Interesting. I like that a lot. Solving business problems as opposed to just staying niched into single family or niched into multifamily or commercial. So great perspective. Um, yeah, we, we just had DJ Savoy, DJ and Jessica that are in uh, Lake Charles, Louisiana, and they're, they own a home investors franchise and whatnot. And they said it's a great right. market. Um, so, so really talking about markets now. So you talked about a little bit of things that you um, look for. And so you talked about the New York market and then the Gulf Coast markets um, that yep. you look for specifically. But somebody that's listening to, to the podcast right now and is thinking, well, you look for those things there, uh, Victor, but what should I look for when it comes to picking a good market and the market selection? What are some things that you can give uh, advice on that with? You know, it's, uh, it's got to be, there's got to be the value there, meaning is you got to, I don't believe that you should go and try and co um, in, reinvent the wheel. Look and see what's working. Now, you don't want to be late in the process. Like, for example, Seattle's a great market. Uh, it's got strong employment. You've got Amazon. You've got Microsoft. You've got Expedia moving into a new building in the downtown. Um, uh, you've got, um, you know, just a tremendous amount of really great employers in that area. You've got Starbucks. The problem is it's overbuilt. You know, there's 25,000 brand new vacant apartments in the downtown. Uh, absorption last year was 8,000 units. Um, so it's it's overbuilt. There's another 30,000 at the permit stage. Uh, it's overbuilt. Uh, so I would not go into Seattle. Um, again, supply and demand. If you look, for example, some of the areas uh, that were fire ravaged in Northern California, some people are going to take their insurance check and leave. But still, 14,000 homes were destroyed. There's, a, there's an acute need for housing in those areas, acute. Um, and if you can go solve that problem, you can make a lot of money. Uh, you know, if you're not doing something in your own backyard, go where the need is. And that need is going to persist. Uh, you know, 14,000 homes don't get built in a week or six months even. Mm -hmm. It's going to take longer. I like that. And that yep. goes along with your vision for Gary. You got it. That's what I, I mean. So, so and, and 
everything's become market driven. We don't have this national real estate um, market like we we've had you know, for, for a long time, it's, it's becoming more and more localized and it really goes by those local needs and those local things that happen. So I, th I think every investor ought to be looking at where they should be positioning themselves. And maybe they do have a local market that, that they can understand is jobs are coming to people are going to move to, or people are moving away. Um, or maybe they need to go outside of, you know, their state borders or outside of even their country. I mean, we, we, I talked to a guy who was doing a massive project in um, in Australia because of the, uh, the the ore that's getting you know taken out of north northeastern um, Australia, and it, China's like built these massive buildings, these massive uh, um, iron ore extractors, and people are are basically flying on Monday, living up there until Friday and then flying back to where they live and they don't really have this infrastructure built in that in that area. So they're going in there for the government almost uh, and actually a building, you know, infrastructure they need they need doctors, they, they have need the need. Everything exactly. Yeah. So it's about that supply and demand and trying to find trying to find places where you can be ahead because like you said you don't want to get you don't want to get late to the game just because Seattle's great it, it may still not be a good place to right. invest right now um, but you right. want to find those places where you can kind of see where it's coming and put yourself in 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 that opportunity zone not really opportunity, opportunity. Zone, but <laughs> not we've been talking about opportunity podcast, zone but <laughs> act, a real opportunity zone of what you know position yourself to take advantage of, of that opportunity that that's about to happen and um then just be a servant and really just 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 be that steward and uh, to that community. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Um, all right, so we're going to switch tracks a little bit. We got one more question for you, and then we're going to wrap this down with our uh, final two questions, the final round that we have. We ask every single interviewee. Um, so when it comes to entrepreneurship, obviously you that, that's something that's very real to you. Um, what is one big thing in the entrepreneurship world uh, that ha that you have learned maybe the hard way um, that you can give warning signs to our listeners. When when projects uh, run into trouble, it's rarely an act of God. It's rarely because you got struck by lightning or something like that. Most of the time, if you run into trouble, it's because you've got the wrong people in the wrong chairs. Uh, and I think if you do a retrospective and look at any problem that you've ever had, I would bet I'd bet you a you know a large, um, well, fill in the blank, whatever you want. I'll bet you something pretty good that it was you had the wrong people in the wrong chairs. And so that's almost always the case. Um, if you're if something's not working, look at the people. You know, is are you asking someone to do something that they're not good at? Uh, often that's the case. And so what you need to do is you have to have the courage, and it takes courage, to make a change. It doesn't mean you kick someone to the curb. Maybe you redefine their role into something that really plays to their strengths, and then you bring in the skills that are missing. Now, you might be saying, I've got uh, too small a business, I can't afford to hire, I can't afford to bring in those skills, but you got to figure that part out. You got to maybe you got to do bigger projects so you can afford those skills. Whatever you got to do, you got to get the right people in the right chairs. So, what are your thoughts on if you yourself yeah. are in the wrong chair? So, you, you look, you, you fire yourself to hire. You fire yourself, or fire yourself, <laughs> hire somebody else to take place in that. But yeah, what are your thoughts? Well, it, it, it you know teams are complementary. Uh, you know you've got to have people with complementary skills. Uh, if it doesn't, you know, if you're the principal of the project or if you're the principal of the venture, uh, no, you don't fire yourself. But if you're missing some skills, bring them in. If you're, if you again, you say you can't afford it. Well, then figure out how to do projects big enough that you can afford it. Uh, you know, that's the number one mistake I see people make over and over again is say, well, you know, I'm only flipping single family homes. I can't bring in uh, a construction manager. I can't bring in uh, a financial controller or what have you that is necessary to running the business. Well, yeah, if you're running projects that are too small, you're, you're going to get stuck in that low earth orbit that you'll never escape. But if you can find a way to scale your business, Rather than starting small, hoping to grow organically, start bigger, you know, take on bigger, more ambitious projects with the right people right from the very beginning. And nobody says that you have to start building on the ground floor. You can start building on the fifth floor or the 10th floor. Um, and I mean that, you know, figuratively, but you don't have to start on the ground floor. Um, start with a bigger business right from the beginning. 
That's an interesting thought. Just bigger Well, when picture. I say fire yourself, I don't mean fire yourself literally as, as a match renewer. I, I mean fire yourself from those things that you're not yeah, good right. at. If you're not the right person oh, for that seat, like get yourself out of those. And sometimes I think we use the word delegate and I don't mind it. But like in a way, it's like you got to get yourself out of the way to actually let things happen. So and it's further than delegating. Yes, it's way more than delegating. It's 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 like get yourself out of the way. Because a lot of times it's, it's, I mean, the, the, the last guy we talked to in the last podcast Jerry, we just yeah. did, he's like, I'm a control freak. Well, yeah. those, those are the types of positions where you have to fire yourself. You'd yeah. be, be like, get myself out of the way. Let my people, you know, do what they need to do. Right. Absolutely. Love it. Thank you so much for sharing that. So we got, we're, we're going to have to wrap this up. Uh, we got two more questions. Uh, when we have these podcasts, Victor, we ask every single interviewee. Um, these last two questions. So this is, this is going to be round. interesting because Victor doesn't know us that well. So most of the people well, so that I'm are on their podcast know us pretty well. Right. But these next two questions will be good. I'm, I'm interested to hear what he's going to say. So, so good success. You, you've known Tom for a little bit, but um, yeah. like yeah. like he mentioned, you don't know us very well. Um, but when you hear the term "good success," what's the first thing that comes to your mind? What do you think about when you hear that term "good success"? <laughs> you may not like my answer. Well, go ahead. Um, <laughs> So uh, I don't like the word good uh, because good is, eh, it's just good. And it's very seductive sometimes to do good things. And when you do that, uh, you're actually sacrificing the best. Um, and uh, good things are seductive uh, because they're good. So I actually don't like that word. Um, <laughs> uh, so probably not the answer you were hoping for or expecting. Um, success is also very secular. It's not, um, you know, it's very, um, what's the word? It's context dependent. So for example, uh, you know, what might be successful for, um, you know, say Donald Trump would be very different than success for mother Teresa. Um, you know, they're completely different. It's, it's very context dependent. Um, so I'm not sure what it means. I guess is really what I'm saying. That's good. It's fair enough. It's, well, I, I, I'm glad that you kind of took that and went around in circles with it because actually like that's it. Everything you just said in a way is almost on purpose. Um, and, and that is what the brand really stands for is that good success for you is different than good success for right. me. And it's really more about the quality of the success, the right kind of success versus I just have a bunch of success in something. I make a bunch of money. I, 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 I am whatever I am. It's not about that, and that's not what our company is about. Our company is about having the right kind of success, and it's about the right kind of success for you first, and is different than the right kind of success for me. And today, my success is going to be different than what my success is tomorrow. So, um, you know, so you may not think that that you like it, but knowing that you do, me knowing that you haven't been around us long enough, and know that that's kind of where we're coming from with that whole term of good success. It's a biblical term. Um, the word good is, is, has a very, has a wholesome type of, um, thing. Right. It, it, and I think the secular world kind of takes good as, oh, I'm good I, as meaning I'm okay. It's just okay. And that's not what the word good. And that's not the wholesome of the true, um, root meaning of that word. Good. It, it's, it's really about doing something that's right and doing something that's, that's, uh, that's of, um, uh, of a good, like a good name is better to be chosen than, than great riches. So. Well, you know, one of the things when it comes to branding, um, you know, the branding is not what you say it is. It's what people who don't know you say about you. Hmm. So, um, you know, and, and the name really doesn't matter in many respects. I mean, think about companies out there that are some of the biggest brands on the planet. And some of them have quite, actually terrible names. <laughs> I mean, like, like, why would you name a computer company Apple? <laughs> I mean, like. Right. It doesn't make any sense. Right. The only the, the only benefit that naming a company with Apple is that people know what it is. It, it's already imprinted in their brain, and so they're not going to forget the name because it's already in, imprinted in their brain. Uh, and all you're doing in that particular instance is you're redirecting something that people already know and using it in a different context. I mean, Google, like, what the heck is that? Um, you know, you don't necessarily need a great name to develop a very successful brand. Um, so while, you know, my comment was a little bit critical, uh, and I apologize for that, um, it, it matters less. It really matters more what you do 
as a business and the reputation that you develop, that ultimately is your brand. Yeah, right? absolutely. It's the execution of what you're, the, the message you're trying to get across. And the, yep. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. So, all right. So you got to leave the audience with one thing. So whether it's a quote, a thought, a piece of advice, maybe it's a book that you enjoy. Um, one thing that you got to leave the audience with, what would that be? I would say a good deal badly managed is no deal. Love it. Mic drop and that is it. Just like what Victor, I always say. We appreciate you being on the show today. Thank you so much for sharing everything that you did. Um, we look forward to having you back soon if, if you'll have us. And then <laughs> absolutely, um, definitely if you guys haven't, make sure you go check out his podcast, The Real Estate Espresso Podcast. We'll make sure we'll have it linked below um, for you guys to check out. But Victor, it was great having you on the show. We appreciate you joining us and we look forward to having you back soon. Thanks, Great Victor. to be here. Thanks very much. All right. So that is going to do it for today's episode. We appreciate you jumping on and joining us. Um, before I let you guys go, Victor, um, is there a better co way of contacting you as opposed to your website or you just want people to go to your website in order to contact you? They can contact me at the website at victorjm.com. There's a form they can fill out or if they want to email me directly, I'm happy to connect with them directly. It's victor at victorjm.com. So very simple. Awesome stuff. Victor so at victorjm.com. Yes, sir. So victorjm.com is where you guys can uh, check out Victor and everything that he's got. So his podcast is on there, the book's on there. So again, if you want to autograph book from him, uh, The Magnetic Capital, then make sure you go to his website and pick it up there. Or you can pick it up on Amazon, but it's not going to be autographed, so you'll miss out on that. So make sure you take advantage. Um, so that's going to do it for the episode. We appreciate you jumping on. If you haven't already, make sure you have subscribed to the Good Success Podcast or on all the pod podcast platforms. Just go search for us and you'll find us there. And make sure you subscribe, but also leave us a review on Apple Podcast five stars would be amazing. Let us know what you think about this show, and that would be great. And then the Good Success Mastermind is coming up February 4th through 8th, but the next event is going to be May 14th through 18th in Miami, Florida. To learn more about it, go to goodsuccess.com slash mastermind, and you can fill out the application there if you haven't already, and you'll talk to either myself or Tom. Community Go-Giver tickets are early bird priced right now, but that is going away very soon. So save a couple hundred bucks. Go to communitygogiver.com to learn more about that. A lot more details to come out, so make sure you're following us on all of our platforms and so you can see um, all the things that we're rolling out pretty soon. So that's going to do it for today's episode. We appreciate you jumping on and joining us. And remember to be a conduit, not a bucket. Work to have to give. Thank you for joining us.